Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Very good morning and welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin today's discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the Delhi edition of the Hindu, I have chosen nine important articles for a detailed analysis. We have three articles that are extremely important for our mains and as well as for the prelims examination and the rest of the articles which are smaller articles in the newspaper they are more important for the prelims exam so let's cover these topics one by one and if you guys are liking our initiatives do let us know by pressing the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel also before we start let me wish everyone a very happy holy and we are also pleased to announce the English online classroom program and the next batch under the program is beginning from the 30th of March. So if you wish to enroll, we are offering a 50% discount and you can contact the number provided over here. And also please note as part of the free special classes that we are running on the Unacademy app. Today we have a session on international relations. It's part of the series which we have been conducting over the last two weeks where we are studying the contribution of Indian Prime Ministers in shaping India's foreign policy. So today afternoon at 1 p.m., we will cover a very important topic where we will focus on the contribution of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh to India's foreign policy. So do catch this session live on the Unacademy app and the link for the same shall be provided in the video description below. So with this, let's get started with the analysis of the Hindu newspaper by looking at a set of columns on page number six and seven. On these two pages, we have three important columns that deal with tuberculosis or TB. Because yesterday was a very important day. The 24th of March is marked as World TB Day. So in that, in that regard, the Hindu is carrying out a detailed analysis of India's strategy to combat tuberculosis. So we have three columns. There are two columns on page number six that highlight the issues uh, in India's fight against tuberculosis and a few solutions are being provided by the writers. We also have another column on page number seven that specifically talks about the problems related to diagnosis of TB and what right approaches can be taken with regard to diagnosis. So let's use this opportunity to understand this topic in complete detail because there are many important points for your prelims and mains that we can take away from this particular topic. So let's understand why World TB Day is first celebrated on 24th March. Let's understand the significance of this and then we'll talk about the disease itself. We'll analyze the disease burden of tuberculosis on the world and also on India and we'll talk about the combat strategies as well. So first, the question is, why is World TB Day marked on 24th March? It was on this day in 1882 that Dr. Robert Koch delivered a historic speech at the University of Berlin. Dr. Robert Koch announced that he had found out the causative factor behind tuberculosis. He had identified the specific pathogen, the specific bacteria involved in causing this deadly infectious disease that is tuberculosis. So during this era in 1880s, TB was a widely spreading contagious disease across Europe and even in the Americas. Several people were getting infected. The cases were on the rise. Millions of people were getting affected and the death rate was also significantly high. So given the disruption that the disease was causing, so when Robert Koch announced that he had found out the exact pathogen, the bacteria which was causing it, it was a revolutionary breakthrough. A landmark event occurred on 24th March when Dr. Robert Koch publicly announced that it was mycobacterium tuberculosis, a specific strain of a bacteria which was causing this deadly infection, this contagious infection. So that is why this day is marked as World TB Day. You can see the image of Dr. Robert Koch as well. So following the discovery of mycobacterium tuberculosis, it became easier for researchers to develop different treatments, different antimicrobials 
through which the disease could be tackled. But however, it's been almost 150 years and still we are dealing with a very high disease burden with regard to tuberculosis. We have not been able to eliminate TB and even today there is a very significant disease burden especially in developing countries and poor countries. Hence it becomes a priority goal for the global community and for every government to tackle the disease and to eliminate tuberculosis entirely. So we need to understand why is it so difficult to eliminate TB. Even though it's been 150 plus years since uh, the discovery of mycobacterium tuberculosis, we still have not been able to contain the spread. By the way, there is a vaccine available as well. Many of us would have been administered with the BCG vaccine, right, when we were infants. And it is offered around the world. But problem is vaccination through BCG is not very effective. Right? We will discuss this in more detail because there is another related article in today's newspaper regarding a TB vaccine. I'll come to that point later. So we have not been able to contain the spread and it still has a very high burden, especially on developing countries and poor countries. So that is why it becomes important to focus on elimination of tuberculosis. It's not just about containing and managing the disease. The goal has to be elimination and that's what the global community is working towards. So now let's understand what exactly is tuberculosis. I'm sure many of us would have studied this in our school days. So those who know this, it's like a revision for you and those who don't, right, you will get some important facts which could be very helpful in your prelims. So tuberculosis, as we already understood, it's caused by a bacteria. It's a bacterial infection caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Here you can see the structure of mycobacterium tuberculosis as well. This cylindrical structure with a flagella, right? So this is mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes this deadly infectious disease. Now there is a big misconception that TB is always a respiratory or pulmonary disease. While it is true that TB primarily affects the lungs and pulmonary and respiratory function, TB can even affect other organs as well. There are different variants, different uh, strains of the bacteria which have come up over the decades. They can affect different organs including your spine, intestines, lymph nodes and as well as the brain. Is that clear? So don't be under the wrong assumption that TB is just a pulmonary or a respiratory disease. Yes, primarily it affects the lungs, the lining around the lungs as well, causing pulmonary and respiratory disorders. Apart from that, it can even affect your lymph nodes. It can affect the intestines, the spine and even the brain. Is that clear? So please remember this. It's a very important point. Now, how does the bacteria transmit? What is the mode of transmission? Transmission is airborne. That is what makes tuberculosis more deadlier. Because if someone comes in close contact with an infected person and spends enough time with the infected person in a close, dense environment where there is very poor ventilation, there are high chances that you might contract the pathogen. Especially in crowded areas, densely populated uh, locations, right? And in buildings where there is no clear pro proper ventilation. If you're close by to an infected person, you can easily contract the disease. So the transmission route is quite easy. It's an airborne respiratory infection primarily, spreads through contact, spreads through a close interaction with the infected person. So that is the reason why ventilation, hygiene and spacing matters a lot when it comes to containing tuberculosis. But that is always a problem in populous countries, in developing and uh, underdeveloped countries. Hygiene and sanitation might be a problem. Right? Very high standards of hygiene and sanitation cannot be maintained in developing countries and poor countries. Also population will be high, there will be dense population in crowded areas and ventilation also may not be proper in houses, hospitals, etc. So that is why TB is predominantly affecting developing and poor countries because of the mode of its transmission. Now what are the symptoms? Following the infection, there is an incubation period. And later, 
the infected patient will start showing some symptoms starting with cough. The cough can get very severe as it affects the lung and the lung lining. It can produce sputum. It could be productive cough, sometimes with blood as well. And this could become a lasting condition sometimes. It could become chronic and it could result in severe chest pain, weakness, weight loss, sudden unexplained weight loss, fever, especially in the evening and night sweats. Fever and shivers in the evening accompanied with night sweats. So these are some of the common symptoms, but of course it can be mistaken for some other diseases as well. So that is why the right testing, the right diagnosis is very, very important, right? This applies for any disease. Now that we have gone through a pandemic, we all know how important testing, diagnosis and surveillance is. If you have effective diagnosis, if you can detect the disease at the early stage and provide the right care and treatment, and isolate the infected patient from the rest. That is the best strategy you can have to contain the spread of any infectious disease. So this applies for tuberculosis as well. Now coming to treatment, I pointed out that there is a vaccine available, the BCG vaccine, which has been used since several decades, right? It's a very old vaccine. It has a history of almost 100 plus years. But problem is BCG vaccine is not very effective. Even though it is administered right, to infants, it does not guarantee complete immunity. Its efficacy is under question because it does not provide you full coverage against all the strains of the bacteria. All right. So I told you that we will discuss this later. There is another article in today's paper in the prelim section. So we will discuss what is the composition of BCG vaccine and there is a new vaccine which is being uh, produced right and put for clinical trials. So we will discuss that later. Just hold on for some time. Now coming to treatment. The treatment is primarily through antimicrobials, essentially antibiotics. So there are few powerful drugs that are available, which we have developed. And this has been the big advancement that the field of medicine has seen over the last 150 years. Thanks to these antimicrobials, especially the, the powerful first and second line drugs, such as rifampicin, isoniazid. These are very powerful first line antimicrobials, right? Developed many, many decades ago, right? Almost a century ago, these strong antimicrobials were developed and they are primarily used as the first line of treatment for tuberculosis. But problem is with antibiotics and antimicrobials, there is always overuse and abuse of these drugs. As you know, we all tend to self-medicate, right? We prescribe medicines to ourselves, right? We presume that we are doctors, we try to treat ourselves. And also regulation of the, the drug industry, the pharma industry is very poor. And some of these prescription drugs are easily sold over the counter. Right? You can just walk into a drugstore or pharmacy and get uh, any of these antibiotics and antimicrobials, even without a doctor's prescription. So when you don't complete the dosage or when you self-medicate or when you over depend on these first line of drugs, automatically it gives rise to multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. The bacteria itself starts developing a degree of immunity against the first line of defense that we have. Plus our body's immunity system as well right, loses the ability over a period of time when you overexpose yourself to these first line of drugs. So at a certain point, we see the rise of these super bugs, these drug resistant bugs or pathogens. And we have something called MDR tuberculosis, multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Now, if you're in infected with one of uh, one of uh, such a uh, super bug, right, even your first line of drugs may not work. So this has been our basic line of defense from many decades. These basic antimicrobials have given us at least a line of treatment. But now this is being challenged due to the rise of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Then the other serious threat is the emergence of extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. Usually when MDR-TB arises, when first line of anti-TB drugs are not working, 
right? When the patient is not responding to, to the treatment. The second line of drugs such as bedaquilin is used, which is a much stronger uh, antimicrobial, right? And the patient is put on a treatment course of bedaquilin. But as I told you, there are these multi-resistant, extensively resistant tuberculosis variants that have come up. And this is a factor of the hygiene levels as well in the hospital. The poor hygiene conditions, abuse of these drugs, they all contribute to the rise of these superbugs. And XDRTB or extensively drug resistant TB is a nightmare scenario. Because this is not treatable even with your second line of anti-TB drugs. Now, if this becomes widely prevalent, if these strains become widely prevalent, it's as good as going back to 1800s. We will lose all the progress that we have made in the last 150 odd years if your first and second line of drugs become ineffective. So this is one major challenge and serious concern that countries are dealing with. If you take, for example, India, India has a very high burden of multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. Is that clear? So that is why containing the spread and eliminating the disease altogether is extremely important. Now let's look at the global status. Let's understand what is the global disease burden. Let's look at some verifiable data and then look at the Indian context. Recently the global TB report for 2023 was brought out by the WHO, World Health Organization. Very important point for your prelims. So WHO every year publishes the global TB report and according to the report, which is based on 2022 data, India has the highest disease burden in the world. Approximately around 7.5 million to 10 million cases are reported around the world. Is that clear? That is the global disease burden. The minimum number of cases being seen is around 7.5 million as of 2022 with a maximum of 10 million cases. So the number of cases around the world is in this range, which is quite significant. It's, it's quite high for one given year. And almost 27 to 30% of these cases occur in India. So that clearly shows that India is the hot spot of tuberculosis. India reports the highest number of cases in the world. We have a disease burden of nearly 27 to some, somewhere between 27 to 30% of the global disease burden is in India. So that is a matter of concern. And if you take other developing countries into account, let's say Indonesia, Philippines, some African countries and even China, they account for majority of the cases, almost, almost 87 to 90% of the cases are occurring in these developing nations, Asian and African countries. So Asia, Africa, even Latin America, they are primarily affected by tuberculosis. So this is a disease of the global south. It wouldn't be wrong to say that TB is largely affecting the global south countries, developing and underdeveloped countries. There was a time when it was affecting European countries and Americas as well. But this was 1800s and early 1900s. But as they developed, Right? They solved most of their basic problems, including such contagious infectious diseases by improving their health care, by, by improving their diagnosis, their treatment, and also by improving overall surveillance and health infrastructure. Right? And more importantly, they managed to improve their hygiene cleanliness as well. Also, they have a lower population burden. Right? So this has helped the developed countries to largely contain TB. But today it has become a problem of the global south. Many developing countries in Asia, Africa and Latin America, they have the highest disease burden. And India stands out amongst them with nearly 27 to 30% of the global burden being reported in India. Now, what, what is the exact status of TB in India? How many patients are getting infected? What's the death rate? What's the mortality rate in India? Right? And what is India doing to deal with this deadly epidemic? See, India has recorded around 2.8 million TB cases in 2022. Again, these are not very accurate figures. It's more of an approximation based on whatever data was available for 2022. There could be many cases where the testing never happened, the diagnosis was never done. Right? 
there could be many cases which weren't recorded. So you can safely assume that we are getting around 3 to 3.5 million cases every year. That's why I told you our total disease burden is between 27 to 30%. Now, the fatality ratio is around 12%, which is extremely high, which means we are losing almost 3 to 3.5 lakh people every year because of tuberculosis. Understood? And especially those who are suffering from other related conditions and comorbidities like HIV AIDS patients, for example, whose immune system is already compromised, they are at a greater risk with regard to mortality. A number of people who already had contracted HIV AIDS, right, and they, they become more vulnerable to various infections. And tuberculosis becomes a critical factor which leads to the death of the patient. So people with other comorbidities are at a greater risk. Senior citizens, those with diabetes and other uh, conditions, right? They have been more vulnerable and India has a significant mortality rate. Almost 3, 3.5 lakh people are losing their lives every year. And this can be avoided. We can almost bring this down to almost zero and we can even eliminate this entirely. So it's not excusable to have such a high disease burden and such a high mortality rate in today's times. So it requires enormous effort from the government, from the healthcare industry and from the people in general to combat this disease and its burden. In India, even multi-drug and extensively drug resistant TB cases are relatively higher. Almost 1.1 lakh cases in India have been classified as multi-drug resistant in 2022. Several cases of extensively drug resistant TB also have been reported in certain hospitals. So this is a serious concern, a very big matter of concern for India. Because as I told you, with MDR and XDR, your first and second line of drugs could become ineffective, leaving us way behind uh, the, the, the curve in the field of medicine. Right? If your basic antimicrobials don't work, it's as good as going back to 1800s and this will make the rest of the population vulnerable as well. So that is why there is a serious effort to tackle tuberculosis, not just in India, but around the world. In fact, WHO, the World Health Organization, has put in place a strategy to end tuberculosis by 2035. The United Nations has set an even more ambitious goal of eliminating tuberculosis by 2030 as part of its sustainable development goals. Under the 17 goals of Agenda 2030 or also called Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, if you look at goal number 3, SDG number 3 and target number 3, so SDG 3.3, .3, it deals with fight against communicable diseases. It's part of the health goal, good health and well-being. Good health and well-being is SDG number three. That's the third goal. Under that, you have the third target, which is to fight and eliminate communicable diseases, especially HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, hepatitis B, and other neglected tropical diseases. These are the priorities of the UN under SDG. So tuberculosis has been given a high priority and the goal is to reduce the incidence of the disease and to eliminate it entirely. Is that clear? So WHO has set a target for 2035 to end tuberculosis in the world. It wants to achieve a 95% reduction in mortality rate by 2035. WHO wants to achieve a 90% reduction in the incidence of the disease. And it wants to assure the global community and bring down the TB affected families to zero, which could face catastrophic costs due to TB infection in the family, right? So these are some of the broad goals that have been set by the WHO as well to end tuberculosis. The Indian government has been combating the disease since many decades. We have had many programs which have been run and today we have streamlined all the previous programs and new initiatives have been launched by the Modi government. We have a national TB elimination program as part of the national health mission. 
the focus is on early testing early detection with improved surveillance improving diagnosis making testing easier and simpler because usually health centers rely on chest x-ray to detect tuberculosis but this may not always be effective because by the time a chest x-ray picks up a serious pulmonary infection caused by tuberculosis it could already be a little late so early detection is important there are simpler ways of testing today thanks to advances in technology and medical testing there are easier ways to get better accurate results to ensure that the false positives and false negatives can be minimized so national tb elimination program is something that the government of india is driving and recently pm modi has announced tb mukt bharat abhiyan and pm modi has set a very ambitious goal to eliminate tuberculosis by 2025 which is 5 years before un sustainable development goals and almost one decade before who's strategy but many experts believe that this is a very unrealistic target that the government has set because 2025 is next year and we still have 7 to 10 million cases coming up in india right so the target is unviable it's unrealistic but at least we should strive towards complete elimination of the disease and if not 2025 at least between 2025 to 2030 would still be a reasonable target for india so the modi government has launched a initiative called nikshay mitras to provide patient centric care for tb patients in india because providing adequate care with regard to their medication their nutrition regular uh, follow up checkups this is very important now not everyone might get family support and since it's a contagious disease right there could be hesitation as well to help the patient so the government has launched this program where nikshay mitras are identified who work as volunteers in rural areas right they go house to house they assist the tb positive patients and help them in their overall treatment and recovery so there is a nikshay poshan yojana as well to provide financial and nutritional support to ensure adequate nutrition is provided to the patient plus patient centric initiatives have been launched with family caregiver model and differentiated care that is those who are having more serious symptoms right those who don't have family members to take care of them they are given preferential treatment where volunteers are assigned to look after the patient and provide for patient centric patient friendly uh, treatment and care in the hospital network especially in public uh, healthcare hospitals so all these initiatives have been implemented but still we are far away from reaching a target as i told you by next year it's unlikely that india will eliminate tb but if we can do it in the next 4 5 years it would still be a incredible achievement india has shown some progress over the last 2 3 decades due to better health management and improved health infrastructure according to a recent report brought out in november last year which was brought out by who it acknowledged the success that india has seen in the field of uh, tb management india has reduced the incidence of the disease by 16% from 2015 to 2022 now this is quite incredible in the last 7 years right under the modi government with better focus on uh, primary health care especially in rural areas and with greater focus on early testing and detection and diagnosis the incidence of the disease has gone down quite significantly by 16% mortality rate is down by 18% due to improved treatment facilities So this success of India has been acknowledged by WHO recently but we still have a long way to go because we still have the world's highest disease burden at around 27 to 30% of the cases in India and still we have a high mortality rate almost 3 lakh plus people in India are dying out of TB millions of cases are coming up every year in the country so this is a significant challenge for India so what are the roadblocks what are the hurdles that we face when it comes to TB control and TB management first of course is the poor healthcare infrastructure that we have in the country the limited public health expenditure the limited budgetary allocation for public health 
and the poor public health infrastructure, especially in rural areas. If you look at the grassroots healthcare institutions, which is your primary health centers, primary healthcare centers, PHCs, they have to play a critical role because primary healthcare centers, they will have the widest presence and the widest reach, especially in the rural areas where the disease burden is significantly higher. So this is where we need to focus upon improving the grassroots infrastructure, investing more in public health care, expanding uh, the pri primary health care center network, focusing more on diagnosis, bring in new technologies that are available. There are new technologies available which has simplified testing, which can improve surveillance, which can provide for early detection. Instead of relying on complicated lab tests and chest x-rays, there are more easier, simpler methods of home test kits and easier test methods that are made available today. You can even make use of advanced technologies like AI tools to even bring up better diagnosis and improve uh, disease detection across the country. So improving diagnosis with a better grassroots healthcare infrastructure is going to be critical. Next, in the private sector, right? The private sector, which largely takes up the burden of patients in India, there is a lack of regulation. Because most of us, we end up relying on the private healthcare system due to the poor public health uh, in India, due to the poor public health uh, infrastructure in the country. Many people rely on the private healthcare industry, but they are not as focused as government institutions. They are not following the elimination goals, the targets as seriously as this, they are supposed to. So bringing them under greater regulation and aligning them with the goals of the government is very critical. Ensuring that private hospitals in cities, in small towns, even in rural areas, they align with the public health goals, right? Ensuring that is, is very important. Then special attention has to be given to the more vulnerable, those with comorbid comorbidities, those who are infected with HIV, right, which increases the mortality rate. They should become a priority to ensure that they are treated adequately and mortality rates are brought down. Then we should focus on drug resistant TB, improve hygiene, improve sanitation, tackle the abuse of antimicrobials, the misuse of the first and second line of drugs. So this is extremely crucial. So this remains a priority even for the Indian Council of Medical Research. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has to work with state governments, uh, public health care institutions and even the private uh, hospitals to improve sanitation, hygiene and ensure that there is no abuse of antibiotics and antimicrobials. And finally, we need to focus on tackling malnourishment and poverty because these are contributing factors, right? And it creates a vicious cycle. If poor families are affected by TB because they're more vulnerable, it pushes them further down into poverty and affects their nutrition. So as they suffer from malnutrition, it makes them more vulnerable to, for the disease and mortality rates could also increase. They may not recover as quickly as others. So it's a deadly vicious cycle that gets created and this has to be broken by focus on nutrition and poverty levels. So all these are challenges that are present and India has to prioritize some of these initiatives that we have discussed. So one way forward is to further improve the person-centric solutions. Now, this is something India has already started with Nikshai Mitra initiative, right? There are volunteers with whom the government is using to provide personal care and attention to TB patients in the country and provide for family oriented care. So person centric treatment and solutions will play a big role. It will give more attention to every individual patient. So this is something India has already started, but we can further build upon this. Adopting technology especially with regard to testing and diagnosis, right? To help in early detection and also even employing AI tools for better pattern analysis and trend management. This is again going to be crucial. So essentially, this has to be the mantra. First is early detection, the first step. Second step is precise treatment, identifying the exact strain, the antigens present and providing the right kind of antimicrobial treatment. 
then ensuring that the patient adheres to the treatment course this is where the volunteers will play a big role or the family members will play a big role whoever is looking after the patient they have to ensure that the treatment regimen or the treatment course which has been prescribed by the doctors it has to be adhered to strictly it's almost a four to six month course that goes on there should be regular follow-up checkups now this is where people lag behind initially they might get tested but later since it's a very long course treatment people drop out in between they don't go for follow-up checkups or they don't complete the entire course so ensuring strict adherence to the treatment regime is very very important ensuring that follow-up checkups are done this is what is needed to ensure zero mortality so these four steps should become the mantra of India's TB elimination strategy. So this completes my detailed discussion of tuberculosis. You can expect not just basic prelims questions, but even a detailed mains question can be asked. You, you should know not just about the disease, you should know about the burden on global south countries or developing poor nations. What's the burden in India? What are the challenges? And what are we doing to tackle tuberculosis? So all these pointers will be very, very important. Now let's look at the next column from page number nine. This column deals with digital financial frauds in India, which has acquired alarming proportions. In the last decade, as the Indian economy has become more digital, as we have digitized our economy and our transactions, along with that, digital financial frauds and financial scams also have gone up exponentially. And this is posing a huge threat to personal financial stability of our people. Entire bank accounts are being looted by cyber criminals and fraudsters and scamsters. This is a threat to the nation's economy as well. It could threaten your data privacy and it could even become a national security threat. So this topic is very, very important, both for economy and internal security under GS paper three. So let's talk about digital financial frauds. What's the risk in India? What's the extent of cyber crimes and financial frauds happening in the country? And what measures can be taken? How are these scams carried out? How can victims or people become more uh, aware in order to ensure that they are guarded against these fraudsters and scamsters? So that is something we should understand. Now, I will present some data which has been mentioned in the article. These statistics could be helpful when you're writing a mains answer. Let's say there is a question on financial scams and frauds. You can begin your answer with such an important statistic. Right? These are gov government verified numbers. If you look at NCRB, National Crime Records Bureau, which maintains data on uh, crime rates in the country, it comes under Ministry of Home Affairs. According to NCRB data, the burden of such financial frauds has crossed 66 crores with 4,000 plus cases in 2023. But experts don't agree with this number. They think it's a gross underestimation because other industry estimates and government estimates, they put the number at a much, much higher level. Hundreds of crores at least or a few thousand crores is being lost to these cyber criminals and fraudsters every year. If you look at Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center, which is also under the Home Ministry to coordinate with uh, state governments, the state police and the cyber uh, security wings, and, and to ensure that central law enforcement agencies can coordinate with the state law enforcement agencies. We have the Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center, according to which in the last three years, the financial burden has been a staggering 1.25 lakh crore rupees. This accounts for all kinds of cyber crimes, fraud, scandals that have happened. Right? Of course, NCRB numbers look smaller because the methodology used was different and the kind of crimes they were looking into was different. But if you look at National Cyber Crime Reporting Portal, which has been set up by the Ministry of Home Affairs, where you can report cyber crimes. According to this portal, the losses are at around 10,000 crores for individual customers in the country just in 2023, which is a very significant number. That's more than a billion dollars, right? So in short, 
Indians are becoming victims of cyber crimes, digital frauds and financial scams at an alarming rate. It's not just the digitally illiterate or it's not just senior citizens and old people who are falling for it. Even educated individuals, even IT engineers themselves who are aware of cyber crimes and financial frauds, they are also falling prey to these scams and frauds. So it's important to understand how exactly these frauds are carried out. What are the different types of digital frauds that exist? Right? At least some basic knowledge, some basic awareness is essential. Because there can be a means question where UPSC might ask you to elaborate on this topic, identifying the different trends and patterns with regard to digital frauds happening in the country. Because see, don't forget, such cyber crimes, they could be transnational in nature. Meaning they could be coming from across the borders. The cyber criminal, the fraudster, the scamsters, they could be sitting anywhere in the world. Because in the digital world, in the cyberspace, there are no geographical boundaries. Right? You can conceal your location, you can become completely anonymous. You can conceal your identity, your IP address and your location and you can become completely anonymous on the internet. So this anonymity offered in the cyberspace is what enables the criminals and the fraudsters to blatantly commit these crimes. So there are many hubs of these cyber crimes that have come up. For example, Myanmar has become one such hub. It, in fact, it has become like an organized criminal cartel. It's not just one individual or a small group of individuals. It's acquired such proportions. Now it's comparable to drug trafficking, arms trafficking, human trafficking. On that scale, right? criminal organizations are involved in professionally running these uh, criminal and fraud, fraudulent activities. So today, cyber crime and frauds and scams are considered as part of organized crime. So in Myanmar, for example, there is a major hub of cyber criminal organizations that run as if it's a, it's a huge industry, right? In India as well, many of you might have even seen related web series and shows uh, based on Jamtara. That's just one example from India. There are many Russian, African cartels as well which are very proficient in pulling off these simple frauds and scams. They often trick people, deceive people, right? They essentially make them believe that they are receiving a genuine communication and they entrap them and make them compromise their financial information. For example, I'm sure all of us have been getting a lot of WhatsApp calls and messages, random video calls, random num calls from international numbers. Right? Let me know if you have got them in the comments below. Now, many of these calls are designed to immediately implant a malware onto your device. There have been incidents where the moment you receive a WhatsApp message and you start replying to it or you pick a call, right? this is, is sufficient to plant a malware on your device, which then could be used to access your data, your banking information and to steal your money as well. But apart from that, there are more simpler techniques because not everyone can design such sophisticated malwares. Using such a sophisticated cyber weapon is actually a little complicated. But there are many easier, simpler methods of pulling off these uh, scams and frauds. Like for example, they call you, they contact you and they say that they have a very attractive job offer. Right? You, you might get WhatsApp messages saying that you just have to leave Google reviews and you'll get paid uh, 5,000 rupees a day, 10,000 rupees a day, etc. Or you might get a Telegram message on a Telegram group saying that there is a very attractive cryptocurrency. If you invest your money, you'll earn double the money. They promise 2x returns. Right? So, of course, any person who is aware of the basics of cybercrime and frauds, they'll never fall for this. But unfortunately, there are many people, I told you, educated people who have been tricked to, you know, fall for these scandals and, and uh, these frauds. Essentially, we call these techniques as phishing techniques. Phishing techniques are used along with social engineering. These are two technical terms used in cybercrime. Phishing is basically a fraudulent method of tricking people to commit some action. Right? The word is drawn from the act of catching a fish. 
when you're using a fishing rod to catch a fish, you're using a bait, you're using a food item, you place it on the hook, right? You, you place a piece of bread or meat or a worm on the fishing hook and you deceive the fish, you trick the fish to think it's actually food. The moment it grabs onto the hook, it gets caught in the fishing hook, right? Something similar happens here, right? In, in fishing attacks, the target is tricked, is deceived by using a bait, by some promise, right? They're, they're pushed to commit some action, maybe click on some f link or uh, download some attachment or share some information. So this is essentially social engineering. They are playing with your psychology. They are engineering your mind. Social engineering is basically using psychological techniques to engineer your mind, to change your behavior, your choices. For example, let's say I've listed a product on OLX. I want to sell a furniture, a piece of furniture. Now some customer contacts me saying he's interested in buying this. Now I am very happy I'm to get rid of this sofa and, and I, I want to sell it as soon as possible. So I may not think much and the customer, the so-called customer, he tells me that, see I'm sending you a QR code, please scan that. Once you scan, you'll get the money. But you tell me, where do you scan to receive money? You always scan to send money when you're using UPI payments. There are many people who have fallen for this, right? Especially on OLX itself. People would be selling their cars, their bikes, their furniture, whatnot. And people are pretty desperate to sell off these old products. So the moment someone comes to buy that, they're very excited. And that is where they get tricked. That is where they fall for phishing and social engineering. Since they're very eager, desperate to sell as soon as possible, the moment a buyer agrees to pay the price, they're very happy. Right? They don't put much, uh, put much thought into it. So whatever the buyer is asking them to do, they'll end up doing it. Sometimes they will say that I have accidentally transferred more money. Please, can you send more money, uh, the money back to me, right? Or there is an OTP which will come on your phone. Can you please share that with me? So people will easily fall for the tricks and they reveal the information. Or sometimes they end up sending money to the to the buyer, right? So this, these are very simple methods. Same with the crypto scams and job scams. If you leave Google reviews as they are asking, you will actually get paid initially. Initially, they'll, they will pay you money, right? You can try it out if you want. There's no harm in it. You can get paid a decent amount for initial few tasks. But later, they will start pushing you to pay them money and you'll end up doing it because you're engineered. You're engineered to think that you're going to get enormous amounts of money for just leaving reviews on Google pages. Now, that is too good to be true. That will never happen. Now, whatever communication you, you get, be it a call, a message, or a mail, always think if it's too good to be true, it's usually a lie, it's usually a fraud. Nothing in life comes easy, right? Now, at, at the earlier days of the internet, for example, right, uh, Americans especially, who are not used to computers and the internet, the average American, they massively fell for these frauds. They would get these mails from a so-called Nigerian prince, saying that you won a lottery of $1 million and to send the lottery money, you have to send me uh, some amount to clear the taxes and other processes, etc. So people actually fall for that. They think they'll actually get $1 million. So they don't hesitate to send maybe $1 lakh to whoever is asking for it. It's happened in India, right? People get messages saying that one lottery is there uh, receiving a huge sum of money from abroad, but they have to pay some money for clearing the taxes, the customs, etc. They actually end up paying this money. Recently, many crypto scams have duped youngsters in India. Because during pandemic, there was a massive crypto boom in the crypto market. Everybody started talking about cryptocurrencies. Even those who didn't understand what cryptocurrencies are or how they work, even they started investing in crypto markets. This was exploited by fraud, fraudsters and criminals. I'll tell you one real incident which happened with one of my friends. It's quite uh, hilarious as well. This friend of mine, by the way, is an IT engineer, a software engineer, right, with some experience in uh, cybersecurity. He gets a message on Telegram, right, and WhatsApp as well. Of course, it's a fake account, which he didn't identify then. Uh, the DP, right, the image of the account is, is that of a girl who's uh, good looking. He actually thinks a foreign girl is contacting him, messaging him. He falls for it. He falls for the trap. And the account is asking him to download a certain crypto app. He can invest here and he can double his money. He downloads this app. It's a fraudulent app. He didn't realize that. It looks like a proper trading platform. It looks like as if people are actually buying and selling cryptocurrencies. 
and he is encouraged to invest small amounts of money like 2000 rupees 5000 rupees every time he put a small amount he started getting double the amount as promised 2x returns within few days the money would be credited as well so this was done multiple times until they could gain his confidence this was the bait this was the trick they were waiting for him to catch on to the hook now the moment he got convinced that this is genuine whatever money he puts he'll, he'll get the double of that now they started increasing the stakes he went to such an extent that he sold his property there was one apartment he sold the apartment put around 40 lakhs into this fraudulent scheme expecting he'll become a karodpati the moment he made a big transaction all communication stopped now he started getting desperate now he started getting worried that he might lose the money then they contact him again a few days later saying that taxes are due since the money is being wired from a foreign location you have to pay five or seven lakhs more so that we can make the transaction happen and you'll get your profits at least now he should have had the sense to approach the cybercrime police he did not he actually believed them again again made a transaction of 5 to 7 lakh rupees so in total he ended he ended up losing a good 45 to 50 lakh rupees right fortunately some of the transactions were uh, withheld later by the banks and uh, with the help of the police and he did get back some money but again you can imagine how easy it is to trick people right so that is how these fraudulent scams work so it all require all that it requires is better awareness a basic common sense that anything which is too good to be true right it's usually a fraud it's usually a scam so this is where there is a huge impact of these frauds and scams of course it affects your personal financial integrity it results in massive losses people have lost their entire life savings right especially senior citizens old people retired uh, people right who have stepped out of their employment they have lost their entire life savings due to these scams and frauds so this affects their overall well-being it's a big risk to your data privacy you might be asked to reveal some sensitive personal information including your bank accounts your credit card details you might have fallen prey to it revealed all the details and that's that's a big risk to your data privacy right and it could become a huge economic risk and a national security risk because there are direct implications here because usually organized crime including cyber crimes it is connected with terrorist financing there are links connections that exist with terrorist financing and also with money laundering these three are interconnected so that is why it is very very important to tackle the threat at at the earliest as possible so what is being done to protect indians from digital fraud cyber uh, crimes and scandals and what can be done by the people by the users first and foremost we need to spread awareness right let's say there is an essay topic on this upsc can ask you an entire essay given how important digital economy is for india we will face even more uh, digital frauds in the coming decades so there could be an entire essay on this so spreading awareness is the biggest uh, biggest solution the easiest solution as well make people aware of these frauds make them understand the modus operandi that is how do they work what is their method of operation how do they approach when you have this basic awareness as we discussed with examples you will know that when someone approaches you with with these promises you can easily identify that this could possibly be a fraud or a scam and you can immediately stay away from that you can simply block those numbers and if you are a good citizen report that as well today there is a cyber crime reporting portal the national cyber crime reporting portal where you, where you can report these numbers and ensure that others are protected as well so this requires basic awareness then technological interventions by the tech companies all the platforms that we are using right they can come out with simple tech innovations to protect our financial uh, safety and our data privacy for example two factor authentication now let's say you have a google account right i'm sure there is one device that we are using always to log in to this particular account 
either a mobile device or a laptop or a desktop. Now, Google recognizes the IP address of the device and it knows that this is the regular device that you're using. But all of a sudden, let's say, you use your friend's computer or phone to log in. You will notice that there is a block. It doesn't allow you to log in even if you enter the right username and password. Right? There is another authentication. They'll send you a, a notification on your original device where you have to grant approval saying, yes, it's me who's logging in from a different device. And you have to select a certain password which is generated. Right? So this is a basic intervention carried out by companies. All companies implement this today. But we need to spread this, expand this to every product, every digital service that is there. Two-factor authentication can be a very simple solution. Then the UPI payment gateways, they are also spreading the messages and awareness that you never have to scan QR code to receive money. If you go to, let's say, Google Pay, Phone Pay, Paytm, right? You will see the messages clearly right now. They have they clearly highlighted that you don't have to scan any QR code to receive money. You're always scanning QR codes to send money. This is basic knowledge, basic awareness again. So such simple technical innovations, technological interventions can protect the users, the customers. Then improved surveillance and law enforcement by the concerned security agencies. For example, CERT in Computer Emergency Response Team India, the Ministry of Home Affairs, then uh, the concerned state police who have set up their own cybercrime police stations and cybercrime branches, right? They have to be effective in carrying out surveillance, in receiving complaints, in investigating those cases, taking the cases to the logical end, enforcing the law, getting hold of the uh, culprits, right? And del delivering them the punishment. So we have the IT Act of 2000, Information Technology Act, which is the primary law that covers cyber crimes and frauds and scams. And we also have the new law, Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita, which is all set to replace the IPC, that covers all forms of organized crime, which will include such cyber crimes and frauds as well. So these are very powerful legal tools that are available to our law enforcement agencies. But with effective surveillance and better law enforcement, we can definitely tackle the threat. Better monitoring on the cyberspace identifying these trends and patterns and warning the users, spreading awareness amongst them, right? So it's a responsibility of the government, the private industry and the people as well. So that is what needs to be done to safeguard Indians against these digital frauds. Now let's take up the next article from page number 12. This article deals with the Anti-Piracy Act. The Indian Navy chief has referred to the Anti-Piracy Act that was enacted in 2022. It's called the Maritime Anti-Piracy Act. And he has thanked this law for helping and assisting the Indian Navy and the Coast Guard in some of the recent anti-piracy operations that have been conducted all across the Indian Ocean, particularly in the Arabian Sea and towards uh, Gulf of Aden. Recently, for example, a couple of days ago, Indian Navy carried out one of the most complicated maritime operations near Gulf of Aden. We had discussed that as well in one of our uh, Hindu analysis se uh, sessions. So these anti-piracy missions, which are continuing by the Indian Navy, it's part of Operation Sankalp that was launched a few months ago. Under Operation Sankalp, Indian Navy has deployed multiple warships and submarines all across Arabian Sea, Gulf of Aden and Horn of Africa, because this is the hub of piracy. So under Operation Sankalp for more than 100 days, Indian Navy has been combating piracy, Somalian piracy in particular, to safeguard the shipping lanes in the Indian Ocean. It has been taking very proactive action along with the Coast Guard and protecting the waters to ensure safe shipping, because these waters are absolutely critical for India, for the Indian economy. So recently there was one remarkable operation carried out near Gulf of Aden, almost 2,500 nautical miles away from India. Right? An entire team of Marcos, Marine Commandos were para-dropped by Indian Air Force through a C-17 Globemaster. And by using rubber inflatable boats, they reached the hijacked ship, they boarded the ship, and advanced reconnaissance aircraft were also deployed. 
like the Sea Guardian drones, P-8I reconnaissance aircraft and few naval warships were also dispatched to the area. And eventually, the Marine Commandos of the Navy, which is a special force, they ensured that they brought down all the pirates, almost I think 35 pirates. They've all, they've all been detained, arrested, brought back to India and now being charged in India. They've been placed in Indian jail and they will be prosecuted as per Indian laws. So this operation was entirely enabled because of the legal framework which has been created. That is the Maritime Anti-Piracy Act. So in a recent speech that the Navy Admiral was delivering, right, he has given credit to the law for enabling the Navy and Coast Guard to operate beyond India's territorial jurisdiction. This is what gives Indian Navy the authority to act even in international waters, even outside of our exclusive economic zone. Now, please look at the map. Concentrate over here. You are looking at India's long coastline along with our island territories, Lakshadweep and Andaman Nicobar. In total, our coastline stretches to more than 7,500 kilometers, right? Which makes India a significant maritime power. In fact, this whole ocean here is named after India. After all, this was pointed out by the Navy chief as well. So it becomes India's duty, India's obligation to defend and protect this entire ocean, which is named after the Indian subcontinent, right? Since ancient times, India has been the dominating uh, influential power, a maritime power all across this region, right? This has continued throughout medieval modern times as well. And even today, Indian Ocean is the lifeline of the Indian economy. The access that we have to the seas and the oceans towards the east and the west is what allows India to scale its exports and imports and to drive economic growth and development. So any disruption to shipping, especially in critical channels near choke points, is of great concern for India. For example, you have the Hormuz Strait over here between Persian Gulf and Gulf of Oman. You have the Malacca Strait over here near Singapore and Indonesia that connects South China Sea with Andaman Sea and Bay of Bengal. Then you have Babel Mandeb over here near Djibouti that links Red Sea with Gulf of Aden. Right? And this is Horn of Africa. All these are important shipping lanes and they are choke points, strategic choke points. So piracy present, particularly here in near Horn of Africa and Gulf of Aden, is something that has bothered India from many, many years. In fact, prior to 2010, there was few piracy re related incidents near Malacca Strait as well. In and around Singapore, there would be some piracy related incidents few decades ago. But of late, the threat has been tackled because of better maritime uh, security being offered by the countries present here. But that is not the case with East Africa, right? Especially in Somalia, there is an age-old uh, civil war going on from 30 plus years. There is no stable government g ruling the country. And large part of the country is controlled by various terrorist outfits and non-state actors. So many Somalians are encouraged by some of these terror groups and other non-state actors to resort to piracy, to target the commercial ships, to board the ships and to threaten the crew so that they can extract a ransom from the ship owners or from the concerned governments that too in millions of dollars. So this increases the risk for shipping in these vital shipping lanes. It increases the cost of transportation. It leads to delays in shipping. It affects multiple economies that are dependent on these shipping lanes. So India has been very badly affected by Somalian piracy near Gulf of Aden from at least 20 plus years. So Indian Navy has been proactively deploying into the region to combat the threat by working with other friendly navies. We have collaborated with the US, with Japan, Australia, even China. Right? Indian and Chinese navies also have collaborated in certain anti-piracy missions. There are many European navies deployed here as well. Germany, Italy, UK, France. They all have deployments here and India works closely with them to combat the threat. In fact, a few years ago, what happened was Somalian piracy was expanding. They were not only carrying out attacks near Gulf of Aden and East Africa in this region. They started reaching out to other areas. And they started carrying out few attacks near Lakshadweep islands of India. So as a result, the concerned international authorities, they expanded the high risk area. The designation of high risk area was extended, extended, which came closer to India's coastline. 
Now, this was a matter of direct concern for India because if the high risk area is expanded, then shipping here will become more expensive because the insurance cost will shoot up. You will have to pay a much higher insurance premium for the ships passing through these high risk areas. So when this happened, when this designation was done, when the high risk piracy area was extended closer to India's coastline, it became a big concern for India and in fact even UPSC had asked a mains question based on this. How does the expansion of high risk area, the piracy area towards India's coastline affect uh, Indian, Indian interests? Because the cost of shipping will shoot up. Ships may not prefer this route because they have to pay a higher insurance premium that could affect imports and exports of India. And if the ships have to pass through, they have to pay a higher co cost, which will translate into higher transportation cost. This will increase our import bill. It could restrict our exports. It will directly affect our economy eventually, right? So India has been dealing with this threat for a good two decades plus and Indian Navy has been very, very proactive to tackle the threat by working with other friendly navies. Is that clear? So such operations have been frequently conducted. It's not the first time. From the last 20 years, Indian Navy has been conducting such operations where it responds to any distress call. It will intercept those ships. Our special forces will board the ships as well and get rid of the pirates and to safeguard those ships. Sometimes the pirates are brought back to India because now that there is a specific law that allows for their prosecution under Indian courts and under Indian jurisdiction, they are detained, arrested and brought back to India and thrown into Indian jails. So it's in this context that the Navy chief has brought up the importance of the Anti-Piracy Act, the Maritime Anti-Piracy Act. It was enacted in 2022 and you should know the basic provisions. It provides a clear definition for piracy. It defines piracy as an illegal criminal act where pirates board commercial ships and they try to threaten the crew and extract ransoms. So this act of piracy has been clearly defined and the jurisdiction also has been defined. This will not only cover India's exclusive economic zone as per UN Convention on Law of the Sea, the jurisdiction will extend outside of India's EEZ as well. It will extend beyond India's national jurisdiction. Outside of India's EEZ as well, the concerned maritime authorities, that is Indian Navy and the Coast Guard of India, they can exercise jurisdiction outside of India's EEZ to tackle the threat of piracy. That is what gives legal mandate for these operations, anti-piracy operations that Indian Navy has been carrying out far away from India's coastline. So this law is in line with the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. It in a way provides for enactment of UN clause provisions in India and India is a party to it. We are party to the UN clause, right, that deals with all these maritime boundary issues and any jurisdictional issues in the maritime theatre. So we have provided for the enactment of UN clause provisions through this law and Indian maritime authorities like the Navy and Coast Guard, they have full jurisdiction outside of India's EEZ as well. It empowers the Navy and Coast Guard to board the hijacked ships, right? Even in international waters outside of India's EEZ, Indian forces can board the ship, they can seize any questionable material, they can arrest the pirates and they can bring them back to India and jail them in India. So cases can be filed, FIR can be filed under the law against the pirates in Indian police stations and following investigation and prosecution, they can be punished in India by Indian courts. If held guilty, punishment could be imprisonment for life or even death. It includes the death penalty as well. So this is where some countries have criticized the law because many countries have moved away from capital punishment but the Anti-Piracy Act of India retains the death penalty for pir piracy. Is that clear? Next, these offences are extraditable. That is if India has signed extradition treaties with other countries, the pirates can be extradited, can be sent back to the home country where they are sought. So we have signed an extradition treaty with Somalia. In 2017, 
India and Somalia, the Somalian government which remains. Right, we have signed an extradition treaty and few Somalian pirates have been extradited back. We have sent them back to Somalia where they can face prosecution and they can be punished according to the law. There are few pirates whom we have arrested who are lodged in Indian jails and they are, they are serving their punishment in Indian jails itself. So this law empowers the Navy and the Coast Guard to effectively act against piracy and thus safeguard India's interests, maritime interests all across the Indian Ocean. So this completes my detailed discussion of all the mains articles. Now let's take a quick look at the prelims articles. On page number one, please make a correction here. This is page number one. On the front page, we have this article that refers to Stacio Shiv, Shiv Shakti. It's a new designation for a location on the moon. Moon is a celestial body. Right? It's a, it's a satellite, a natural satellite of the Earth. So on this celestial body, a new location has been officially designated by International Astronomical Union. Now what is this location? If you remember the Chandrayaan-3 mission, which ISRO carried out successfully a few months ago, India's Vikram lander carried out a successful soft landing near the south pole of the moon. This landing site was unofficially named as Shiv Shakti Point by Prime Minister Modi. Indian Prime Minister unofficially coined a name because India can't assign names on its own. When it comes to planetary objects, celestial bodies uh, and even satellites, to, in order to designate any location, to mark any certain point and for this to be accepted internationally, there is a certain process. Individual countries can't do it. It has to be done by International Astronomical Union. Of course, the countries can propose. India can make the proposal, right? India is a member country. We are a member of International Astro Astronomical Union. We can propose the name, but it has to be approved by the planetary system nomenclature. Within the International Astronomical Union, there is a group. There is an expert group called Planetary System Nomenclature Group, they have to accept the name and approve it and then it becomes internationally recognized, it becomes official. So now the International Astronomical Union has officially designated Vikram's landing point as Stacio Shiv Shakti. Is that clear? So you should know about International Astronomical Union as well. It's a global uh, non-government organization, it's a NGO, it's a non-government entity that includes astronomers from around the world, individual astronomers, researchers are part of it and also few member countries are part of it. There are around 85 national members and a total of 92 countries including India. So there are few governments which are part of the union. There are individual professors, professional astronomers, researchers who are also members of the astronomical union. So it essentially promotes astronomical research, collaboration between countries and there is a naming system, a nomenclature system which provides international recognition for these names for different locations in outer space. So these are some basics that you need to understand and it is headquartered in France, in Paris. It was established in 1990. So these are some basics that you need to remember. Next. On page number 8, we have a detailed article related to mumps. So there's another article in today's newspaper related to a disease. Recently, there have been new outbreaks in Kerala, Maharashtra and Telangana where mumps outbreaks are increasing amongst school children. It primarily affects young adults, school going children. They are primarily affected by mumps. It is an infectious disease. And multiple outbreaks, clusters are being reported in Kerala, Maharashtra and Telangana. So that is why the topic is in news. Because mumps is something which can be treated. There are vaccines available as well. But still the outbreaks happening in India has raised concern. The question is, how come India has not vaccinated its young children and offered protection against uh, the disease that is mumps? So let's understand a little more about this. So please note down, it is an infectious, contagious disease caused by a virus called 
paramyxovirus. It's a viral infection. It's a contagious viral infection, primarily affecting children and young adults. So adolescents and young children are primarily affected by it. It leads to the swelling of the parotid gland. The parotid gland is present on either side of your uh, face or near the cheek and the throat. If this gland swells up, it leads to massive swelling of the face right from your neck all the way till your ear. This could become very painful. It, it could become, the whole area could become very tender and painful and could even cause fever, uh, sh shivers and other related symptoms. So humans are the only known host for this virus. It primarily affects humans. Humans are the only known host. And worst part is it spreads through contact. Through direct contact, if you come in contact with the infected person, right, it will spread very easily. And even through the droplets, when you sneeze, when you cough, the droplets that are present, if someone comes in touch with that, you will get infected. So infection is pretty easy. That is why these outbreaks are happening in schools. It is usually said as a joke that children are the carriers of all the diseases and outbreaks. Right? One infected child could spread this to the whole school, bring it to their families as well. Right? And they become the carriers of most infections. So in the case of mums, right? Even though it is infectious, it is contagious, it causes these symptoms, it's not very deadly because mortality rate is almost zero. Usually, I mean, majority of the cases, nobody dies from the disease. So as a result, governments have not paid much attention to it. It's not seen as a significant disease. See, there is no specific treatment. There is no particular treatment for mums. You can only provide symptomatic treatment and palliative care. You can, you can only improve the symptoms, provide palliative care to the patient, but there is no specific treatment available. But however, there is a vaccine. It is vaccine preventable. There is a ready vaccine available, but it is not part of our universal immunization program. I am sure you know that Government of India runs a universal Im immunization program where all basic vaccines are administered starting right from uh, polio to all other basic uh, vaccines are administered to young infants re uh, almost reaching up to their uh, adulthood as well. Right? So there is an entire vaccination program as part of the universal mandatory immunization program. So in this immun immunization program, the mumps vaccine has not been included. Why? Because mortality rate is near zero. So it's seen as a low public health concern. But however, it does have an impact. There are few cases where it has turned into encephalitis, right, which could lead to damage to the brain. There are few very rare cases where children have lost their lives. Very rare, but still there are few incidents. And it could lead to other related conditions which might affect the overall well-being of the child. So it is important, according to WHO, to eliminate this vaccine preventable disease. WHO says don't neglect mumps. You, you might have heard about MMR vaccine that covers mumps, measles and rubella. In India, we provide vaccine for measles and rubella, but not for mumps. It's given in private hospitals, right, if you ask for it, but people will not have awareness. And as part of the public initiative, the government initiative under universal immunization program, it's not mandatorily offered. So this is where we have a shortcoming. These new outbreaks that we have seen, that should be a wake up call. Mortality might be less, but still there are risk factors associated. It might affect the quality of life for the, for the children. And it does have a, a health impact. So that's why the article is urging the government to include mumps vaccine as well as part of universal immunization program. Next, on the same page, we have another column related to transfer and transport of captive elephants. Recently, a set of rules were notified by the Environment, Forest and Climate Change Ministry. See, in India, be it wild elephants or captive elephants, they all enjoy the highest degree of protection under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Because elephants are a threatened species, and a vital species in the Indian ecosystem. 
so they have been given the highest degree of protection as a schedule one animal so both wild and captive elephants have this protection and even with regard to uh, possessing uh, an elephant owning an elephant or transporting it or transferring it to another place or another state in india there are certain restrictions that apply so recently the government has further relaxed these restrictions for transport and transfer as far as captive elephants in the country are concerned see captive elephants could be used either in abusive practices like circuses for example or zoo elephants could also be transported and transferred sometimes for educational and scientific uh, reasons and also uh, temples in india right they do have uh, captive elephants as part of uh, religious rites and cultural uh, processions sometimes elephants are transferred from one temple to another as well right plus uh, elephants are also widely used in forest management to catch other wild elephants to tame them uh, to even carry out patrolling in forest areas to conduct census in deep forests they are also used in the timber industry in forested areas to move timber logs elephants are often employed so captive elephants are widely used in india and this increases the risk as far as the misuse and abuse of elephants are concerned so now the government government instead of you know increasing the regulation and making it more difficult to transport and transfer uh, captive elephants it has kept on relaxing these regulations a few years ago the transport and transfer rules had been relaxed to allow temples to transfer the elephants between themselves which itself was opposed by environmental activists so recently a further deregulation has been done now let's say a captive elephant was being transported from assam to karnataka all right uh, let's say it's being done for educational reasons or research purposes maybe a zoo in assam is transferring a, the uh, elephant to a zoo in karnataka now for this there is a certain process to be followed first approvals have to be obtained by the chief wildlife warden of the state who is the highest ranking forest service officer in the state then there is a legal medical process as well the concerned veterinarians right and the concerned uh, forest officials they all have to approve and certify the transport and every state in between right the route that the truck will take because of course the elephant will be transported through trucks or even through rail through whichever state it passes through every state government has to grant the approval it's not just assam and karnataka every state in between also had to grant a approval so this was seen as a system of checks and balances to prevent any abuse or misuse of the law which could harm the captive elephants but now the government has relaxed all these provisions so going forward captive elephants can be transferred and transported not just within a state but across india from one state to another and approvals are needed only in the originating state and receiving state so in this example we took if assam and karnataka approve it if their chief wildlife warden gives approvals that is more than enough the states in between don't have to grant approvals now the fear being expressed by the article is that what if in between the transfer or transport the elephant is pushed towards trafficking what if the elephant is deliberately you know so smuggled off uh, into various abusive uh, practices and purposes which harms the the elephant right so this concern is being expressed regarding the dilution of the transport and transfer rules uh, as far as captive elephants in the country are concerned so that is something you should be aware of as far as environment and ecology is concerned next the tb vaccine i was talking about just one point here we have this article on page 12 according to which bharat biotech which is india's indigenous uh, pharmaceutical company which is well known for uh, developing uh, indigenous covid vaccine right it also has the credit of developing an indigenous covid vaccine so it has tied up with a swiss pharmaceutical giant to carry out clinical trials of a tb vaccine in india this vaccine the spanish tb vaccine right it's in collaboration with few european pharmaceuticals from spain and also from switzerland the actual parent product goes back to a swiss pharmaceutical company and there is a spanish pharma company which has gained the patent so bharat biotech from india is tying up with this spanish firm to produce these effective tb vaccines in india and clinical trials are going to be conducted 
Now, this vaccine is different from your BCG vaccine. Remember, I told you we already have a vaccine for TB, but it's not effective. The reason is BCG vaccine, it's derived from a bovine variant of TB that affects uh, cattle and other bovine animals. Now, this will not give you 100% protection against all antigens and different strains of the bacteria. That is why BCG vaccine's efficacy is very low. It might give you protection for maybe 15-20 years, but beyond that, as you age, BCG's protection will go down. And multiple vaccination has not shown any positive results. If you take additional booster shots, it's not going to give you any more immunity. BCG itself is a very old vaccine. It's more than 100 years old. It's outdated in its technology. It does not cover the wide variant of uh, strains that the TB causing bacteria has developed. It doesn't cover all its antigens. That is where the new TB vaccine can make a difference. This Spanish vaccine, which is now being produced here and being tried out in India, it has been produced by keeping in mind the different antigens that causes tuberculosis, not just of the lung and the pulmonary system, but other related TBs as well, from brain to spine to intestinal TB. So all these associated TBs will also be covered and it's expected to have a higher efficacy. So it all depends on how the clinical trials will go in India. If it is uh, successful and if the efficacy rates are good without any uh, side effects, it might be rolled out in some years and this could transform our fight against tuberculosis. Next, we have another related article. We spoke about uh, Somalian piracy. There is a related article on page 14. It refers to a terrorist attack at a hotel in Mogadishu, which is the capital of Somalia. This terror attack has been attributed to a terrorist outfit called Al-Shabaab. So you should know where this terror group operates. So Al-Shabaab is a terrorist outfit operating in Somalia, in Eastern Africa. You can see how Somalia has been broken. Its control has been broken between different entities. The Somalian government has very limited control over a small part of the country. Rest of it is administered and governed by radical outfits, terrorist groups and other non-state actors. Even Islamic State has made a presence in Somalia, but Al-Shabaab is largely aligned with Al-Qaeda's ideology. Al-Shabaab, which is a Somalian terrorist outfit, is seen to be connected with Al-Qaeda in the, in the Arabian Peninsula and in the Islamic Maghreb. So it has allegiance towards Al-Qaeda's ideology, but even the rival Islamic State also has a presence in Somalia. So the presence of terrorism in Somalia is also a concern for India, right? Given India's dependency on the Indian Ocean and Gulf of Aden, the presence of terrorism along with piracy in Somalia is a dual threat for India. So that is why the topic is relevant. Now coming to the last article for today, on the supplementary page, of the science and tech edition, the Hindu is referring to the Abel Prize for Mathematics. It's considered as the Nobel for Mathematics. It's administered by the King of Norway. We have Nobel for uh, Physics, Chemistry, Medicine, etc. So on similar lines, there is, there is a high award for research in mathematics, right? This is the Abel Prize considered as the Nobel for Mathematics. So the Abel Prize this time has been awarded to a popular French mathematician. You can see him here in the image, Michel Talagrand. He has been recognized for his work in probability theory and functional analysis, which has wide application in mathematical physics and even in statistics, right? So please remember this just as a basic fact for your prelims, even for your state PCS exams. And with this, we can conclude the discussion for today. So please take down the mains practice questions for your answer writing practice. You can take a screenshot or you can write them down. So try to write answers to these questions and post them in the comment section below. I hope you guys have understood everything and I hope you have liked today's session. So do let me know what you think in the comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Till then, take care. Have a good day.